This message is brought to you by House on the Rock Fellowship. We are a church that serves and cares for the Miami Valley region in Ohio. Before you continue, make sure to access the notes from our download section of our message page and have your Bible ready. Thank you for being our guest. Now, some of you sang that louder (laughs) than the worship song we started the service with. Some of you have heard that song before. It is a billboard chart topper in country, rock, alternative, billboard top 100, billboard global 200. That song is one of the top songs in the world right now. And it is about prayer. One of the most recognized, liked, streamed, purchased, sung songs in the world right now is a song about prayer. You think about that for a second, please. It's almost as if there's something within our humanity that recognizes God's place. The presence of evil and a purpose that we have within that. That all hell has broke loose in my life. And God, I recognize Yeah, I know the words to amazing grace, but I'm not living them. And instead of getting my butt to church, my butt's been pretty drunk the last few weeks. God, I need a favor. God, I need a favor. Any of you guys can, any of you relate to that? Any of you relate to that? Some of you can. Some of you are trying to email me right now to complain (laughs) that I would play such a heathen song in church or that I'm wearing a t-shirt to preach in. I have my church socks on, so it's okay. (laughs) There is something within our hearts and our souls because you know what they've said, there are no atheists in a foxhole. That when it all hits the fan and hell breaks loose, Boy, God, I need a favor right now. I need a favor. And you've been there. You might not know how to pray. You might not know to whom God is that you're speaking. But you've thrown those up like a Hail Mary. Now, that's not a cry out to our Catholic brothers and sisters, is it? Okay, when, it say, when he says, I'm throwing up a Hail Mary, what is he referring to? Football play. You know, when there's only a couple seconds left on the clock and we have to score. So we're going to take everybody we can and we're going to send them down. And that quarterback's going to launch that ball and prayerfully someone on our side is going to come down with it and we'll score and win the game. God, the doctors have said this and the Nurses have said that, and the experts have said this, and the tests have said that. God, I need a favor. God, the creditors and debtors have said this, and the bank account said that, and my boss said this. God, I need a favor. God, he went here and she did that. And God, I need a favor. So we're throwing up prayers like Hail Marys. Again, anyone ever been there before? Some of you have. A few more honest people this morning. God bless. 
We, even those of us who would say that we're followers of Christ, in a moment of honesty, we might actually say, you know what, I am a follower of Jesus, but truth be told, I probably don't pray like I should. I've never bumped into a Christian who told me that they should be praying less. It's never happened. Never in all of my years bumped into a Christian who says, yeah, I was thinking about cutting back on prayer. I think I'm good. I'm going to try something else for a while. Not once. Not once. Whether it's around the counseling table or in the hospital room or at uh, the cemetery. Has anyone come up to me and says, you know what? I, just, I think I'm good. I'm going to, yeah. Psh. No, it's normally, yeah, I, uh, I only talk to God when I need a favor. But man, God, I need a favor. So what we are going to do then is, as a people, and I invite you to come along with me, is to journey into prayer for a while. And just introduce broad strokes today on the idea of prayer. Why pray? But then maybe spend some Sundays drilling down on that and why it matters so much. Because maybe you don't know this. Your purpose as created by God, is to pray. Did you know that? Your purpose, humanity's purpose before its creator is to pray. But before we can talk about prayer, let's learn a little bit about humanity. Because if you don't pray enough, it's probably because you don't understand who and what you are. So we need to go to the beginning of things. So this is probably one of the easiest sections of the Bible to get to. Bibles can be intimidating. I get that. So I want you to take one out. They're located in the seats in front of you. Curtis will have some verses up on the screen. If you're following along online, thank you for, for watching. We appreciate that. Find Genesis chapter 2. Genesis is the very first book of the Bible, and Genesis chapter 2 is probably page 2. Page 2. Now, if you've done some Bible reading, when you get into the beginning of things, it's already a little complicated because you expect that Genesis chapter 2 is going to continue Genesis chapter 1, which is about the creation of all things. But it's different. It, it kind of takes a different angle. What Genesis chapter 1 is, how God created the heavens and the earth. He's the creator of everything. Genesis chapter 2 then takes Genesis chapter 1 and zeroes in the telescope really close to teach us about humanity, us. What our part is in the whole scheme of things. And that's really what we want to get to the heart at if we're going to get prayer today. Okay? So, Genesis chapter 2, I'm going to start reading in verse 4 and 5. And if you've never been with me before, I'll read a little bit of scripture, then I'll talk a little bit. Uh, if you have your message notes, which are inside that, that, that sleeve that you used to receive, you, might, you can write some things down, maybe verses or questions that you have. But Genesis chapter 2, let me start reading in verse 4. Please follow along, okay? Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. All right, so all, all that is saying is, here's the account of God making everything. That's what that means. Generations means account of when the Bible says things like heaven and earth or earth and heaven. That's Bible slang for everything. Okay, this is the account of how God made everything. This is what it says. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. Okay, let me, that's saying before creation could flourish, before it could be everything that it was designed and intended to be, before that can happen, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. Okay, that verse right there is crucial. 
if you want to start to understand prayer. And you're like, it doesn't say anything about prayer. It says everything about prayer. Before creation can flourish, two things have to happen. Two things need to be present. One, God's blessing must come down. It hadn't rained yet. God's rain is another way of saying God's blessing. Before everything can flourish, we need God's blessing. And two, we need a gardener. We need a farmer. We need someone who can take the blessing of God and work it into the land. Then and only then can creation flourish. Now, you might not be a good gardener or a good farmer, but you get that, right? You get that. And you and I have both seen those times where it rains and it rains such a capacity that it can't even be absorbed by the land because what, what has to happen to the land? What do you have to do to the land? It's the first thing a farmer's doing. What do they get? We got to till that up. We got to turn that over. We need to prepare it so it can receive it. For creation to flourish, creation is dependent. Flourishing is dependent upon those two things. God's blessing and someone to work it a gardener. That hasn't changed. Hasn't changed. Your marriage, for it to flourish, is dependent upon the presence of God's blessing and someone being willing to do the work. You can have a Bible. You can have multiple Bibles. Some of you have got so many Bibles. And if it just sits there on the side of your bed, a coaster for your coffee, and you're not going to work it, the blessing doesn't work. in your own faith, in your relationships, for flourishing to happen, it still requires those two things. A blessing of God and someone to put in the work. You reach out to me on behalf of loved ones Hey, Pastor Paul, do you think that you could meet with so-and-so or could you go talk to so-and-so because they've really hit rock bottom? I'm like, I doubt that they've hit rock bottom. Well, why do you say that? Because they haven't reached out for help, have they? You are reaching out for help for them. And if they're not willing to do the work, it doesn't matter how much it rains. So, Right down, just in the back of it, depends. That, that creation, flourishing is dependent upon those two things. If we keep reading, verse 7, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. So this is the context that creation flourishing is, is dependent upon God and someone to work it. So what does God do? God makes a farmer. God creates a gardener. And notice, humanity is designed to bridge the gap. Because he uses the ground and he breathes in his spirit. The bridge between heaven and earth, humanity God intended, designed humanity to bridge the gap between the heavens and the earth. He is ground, he is spirit, he is heaven, he is earth. He's designed to do both. The language here, if you were someone who understood the pagan culture of the time when this was being written, is to mirror and play off the idea of how they would make and dedicate idols in pagan temples. Because you would take clay and you would form that, that, that statue. 
which is to be a, a, a manifestation, a visual representation of the deity. And then you would do a ritual by which that is set aside, it is fed, and the mouth is opened so that it can then become the representation of that God in that land. And so God playing upon that idea, Yahweh playing upon that idea of culture says, you know what? I did the same thing because all the earth is mine. And you know what I did? I created a temple. I call it Eden. And inside of Eden, you know what I did? I put my idol. I put my image. And it's you. You are my image bearers, my idols, my physical representation of me on earth. And you're designed to do that very thing. You bridge heaven and earth. If we were to keep reading, in verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and to keep it. That creation is dependent upon God's blessing and us working it. So God designed us to do that very thing and then gave us domain authority to do it. Here, work this, keep this, take care of this. Help it to be everything that it's supposed to be. The best demonstration of that is when God and Adam together, man together, name creation. A little bit later in the chapter, in verse 19, it says this. Genesis chapter two, verse 19. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird in the heavens and brought them to who? Who did he bring them to? Man, why? He has dominion. He has responsibility. This is his domain. To see what he would call them and whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. We name stuff, don't we? We name our cars. How many of you named your car? Yep. You name your phones. You name stuff that you are demonstrating authority over, a connection to. What's the, first, what's the first demonstration of authority that you experience when you're born? Someone what? Names you. A parent names you. And if someone wants to buck that authority, the ultimate expression of that is what? I am changing my name. But look at this within the context of what we're talking about. God made all of it. He made everything. So who should do the naming? Yeah, but who does he have name? Well, he brings it to humanity and says, you name it. You name it. And whatever you name it, that's what it'll be. God. Elephant. Cool. Elephant. I like it. Nice. God. God. Chicken. All right. I like it. Chicken. Cool. Let's do another one. Yeah, this is fun. Dog. Yeah. It's the image of God. I like that. Yeah, you're right. God does another one. Are you sure that's a good idea? Let's give it a shot. Okay. Cat. All right. Pastor Paul had offended me <laughs> when you made fun of cats. I know. Notice how God defers to humanity's domain. You are exercising authority. I respect that. You're starting to get prayer a little bit. I respect your activity. I respect your inactivity because that's the domain that you've been given. So just to tie all those pieces together, okay? From the beginning of our creation, okay? 
God says, note, creation's flourishing is dependent upon my blessing and you working the blessing. You're designed to bridge that gap. You're designed to bridge heaven and earth together. I created you. You're designed to do that. You're designed to be a voice piece for my intention and my will. You're designed with hands and feet and eyes to engage in that space. And I give you authority to function in that space as my image bearers. But then notice what happened next. Evil comes for the idol. Evil comes for the idol. In that culture and time in the ancient Near East, if a god was over a particular land, you would see that land have a temple and you would see an idol within that temple. And to cut off that god from that land, guess what you had to topple? You had to topple the idol. You destroy the idol and you destroy that god's influence. You'll see God do that sometimes, um, like with other false gods and other places in the Old Testament. God will just kind of mess up other people's idols just to like show that he's in charge. But when the Most High instills humanity as having domain over creation, evil comes for that idol. It's a land grab in essence is what it is. Forces of evil that don't want to submit to God. Forces of evil, spiritual forces of chaos don't want to submit to God, but they recognize who has the authority here in creation. Man does. We got to topple that idol. So when you read in Genesis chapter 3, and the serpent was more cunning, you picture in your mind what? Snakes. been to the ark, the snake probably has legs. But that word serpent really means dragon. It means a chaos beast, an otherworldly thing, hell bent on destruction. And so it sneaks and it slithers and it lies to the image bearers to get them to cut themselves. See, see the, the snake can't do it on his own. He can't break and sever that connection. The idol has to do it. The idol has to resist and cut itself off to topple himself, to topple herself. So the land grab can be pulled off. The usurper, if you will. To usurp means to take authority without legal rights. It's to let someone else drive your car when you own the title. Because what happens when they wreck the car? Who are they coming for? It's your car. And all creation falls apart. The, create, the connection has been severed. we become corrupted. All of creation becomes corrupted. But notice what doesn't change. Remember we talked about dependence and design and domain. None of those things change. Man is still man. That, that means everybody. Do not send me that email either, okay? This is humanity, man and woman. Humanity is still Creation is still dependent upon humanity doing that very thing that it was designed to do, to be domain, to, to, to take authority, to exercise God's presence in God's will, if you will. His kingdom come and his will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. In heaven. If you read on, in, in chapter 19, judgment comes against the serpent. Judgment comes against Eve. Judgment comes against Adam. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 19. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread 
till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Verse 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground. We are still responsible to bring about flourishing. We're still responsible to manifest God's presence. Creation is still dependent upon. We are the ones designed. We're the ones humanity bridges the gap. God did not take domain away. We just gave the keys to somebody else. But what God says now is, instead of ground being the place where you foster life, it will now bring about your death. And instead of you working from a place of blessing inside paradise, Eden, you will now work immersed in chaos outside of paradise. And we feel that every day, don't we? You feel that every day. You feel chaos coming around like a serpentine, slithering, squatting, evil force wrapping itself around your family and wrapping yourself around your relationships, wrapping yourself around your finances, wrapping around yourself at work. You feel chaos like a wolf prowling around the flock. You know that it's there. And it takes everything that you can to stand up to the chaos. How does this then reflect prayer? Well, prayerfully, it should be pretty obvious. Prayer is my participation with God's spirit in recreation. Let me say that again. Prayer is my participation, our participation as mankind in God's re-creation. Because it's broken. It's corrupt. And so when I pray the way that I ought to be praying, what am I doing but bringing the broken before the creator and saying, this needs to be restored. This needs to be fixed. In the presence of this sickness, in the presence of this depravity, in the presence of this disease, in the presence of these forces of evil. In prayer, I am participating with the Spirit on recreating all things. Further, prayer is my representing the Creator to His creation. Whoa. What prayer is, is my representing, sometimes we pronounce it this way, representing the creator back to his creation, often in the presence of great evil. To pray is to step in and say, stop. You don't belong here. Think about Adam and Eve. Think about what should have happened in that moment as that serpentine squatter worked its way in and around the garden. The moment he opened his slithering little mouth, what should we have done? Stop. You don't belong here. And because we are operating within our God-given authority, what would evil have had to do? No wonder when Jesus, the new Adam, steps onto the scene, what do you see him doing? Satan, stop. And he flees. Get out of my sight. And what does evil have to do? It flees. So what then is prayer? Is it? 
How do we define prayer? If you're part of our foundations class, you should know this answer real quick. Foundations is our catechism program on, on Sunday nights. Prayer is pouring out my heart before God. Here's something to write down. Pouring out my heart before God in praise, petition, confession, and thanksgiving. Let me repeat that. Adam, did I get it right? I did it? Okay, awesome. He's one of the other teachers. It'd be pretty bad if I got it wrong. That would be bad. Pouring out my heart before God. I'm pouring out from this space, not this space, this space. It might start here, but I'm going to launch it out. This giant resonating chamber that is where my soul is. And I'm going to shoot this out from my heart. It might sound like words. It might sound like songs. It might sound like muddling. It might sound like grumbling. Sometimes it just sounds like breathing because that's all that I can muster in the shape of praise. We did that this morning. We offered up praise. God, who you are, you are majesty. You are wonderful. You are good. You are great. Jesus, we praise you. We shine a light upon your goodness. Praise. Sometimes the, the, the prayer is petition. Father, we need something. Father, we, we, we are recognizing something that's broken. Father, we need you to interject. We need you to do. Confession. We're going to do that in a few minutes. Uh, in our time of confession, our prayer of confession. Most merciful God, I confess. Meaning what? I recognize I broke it. I let sin and chaos have its way with me. Or I was chaos to somebody else. I let that serpentine squatter lie to me. Will you forgive me, please? Confession. The Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Thanksgiving. Sometimes prayer is thanksgiving. God, thank you. Thank you for the morning. God, thank you for our home. God, thank you for these blessings. In our series moving forward, we're going to drill down on one specific aspect and type of prayer called interceding prayer. Interceding is a word that has multiple facets. It certainly is a diamond in scripture. But in one of its most basic forms, the word means to bridge the gap. I'm going to bridge the gap between two territories. Literally, I'm going to stand between and ask heaven to do something here on earth. Zach Williams, we need a little bit more of up there, down here. And so we're going to unpack that idea and what that means and how we see Jesus as our intercessor, the only mediator, Scripture says, between God and man. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. What it means to unite ourselves to the will of God, what it means to untie ourselves from the forces of evil, how to participate in that within a church family as we move forward. And it'll stretch you. It will stretch you. It will stretch your theology. It will stretch your experience. And it will begin to do some incredible things within our church family because this land is dependent upon God's blessing and a gardener. Dependent. And we might say that now it's deficient. In the early 1700s into the 1800s, the Europeans were trying to tackle the seas build these massive ships to go all over the Atlantic, the Pacific, trying to gather and explore and find. And at the time, ship owners recognized that they could expect on these long voyages, one year, three years, five years sometimes, that they would lose half of the crew. It was expected that they would lose 50% of the crew not from storms, not from pirates, not from warring factions, but from what we call scurvy. You're like, what's scurvy? First off, everyone say scurvy. Scurvy. Isn't that fun? It's just fun to say. It's one of those words that just kind of sounds scurvy. Scurvy and snakes. Scurvy is a deficiency. 
Your body is lacking a very central nutrient that it has to have. But what they would start to notice in these long voyages is that the sailors would start to be overwhelmed by some force that their legs would start to swell up. They would become very lethargic, very lazy. They would begin to bleed from all the orifices of their skin. Their gums would bleed. Their teeth would eventually fall out. Their personalities would shift. For the longest time, they're like, oh, this is a rough life. But someone started to poke around and say, you know what? Let's ask ourselves some questions. Is there anything that we could figure out about why this is happening? Because sometimes when these guys come back on land, they get better. And sometimes when they eat better, they get better. And it was deduced, it was concluded that, you know what? They need to eat more citrus. And amazingly enough, as word got around, hey, make sure that the sailors are eating well. Make sure that the sailors, make sure they're eating oranges. Make sure they're eating lemons. The sailors would get better. But here's the another thing that happens. Eventually, people would start to forget that. And so it would get worse again. Because, you know, I only talk to God when I need a favor. But I got my favor. And so I can then forget about it. British Empire really jumped on top of this. We need to make sure that our sailors have lemons. We need to make sure that our sailors have enough citrus. Everything started to go well until about the 1860s when someone in the empire, probably a money guy, said, you know what? I bet you we could cut some corners here and save a buck because those lemons take up a lot of space. What if instead of lemons, we use limes? Because they're smaller and we can get a really good deal on limes. So financially, it's better. And even more so, we could just boil these suckers down and render out the juices. And then the guys can drink that and we'll be perfectly fine. Problem. In your attempts to save a buck, in your attempts to cut a corner so you can save more cargo space for more treasure, limes only have 50% of the vitamin C as lemons. And when you subject them to heat, the vitamin C is destroyed. I hate to tell you this. When it comes to prayer, you can't cut corners. You can't back end the system. It is your purpose. And the very thing that you're trying to save. Because of the deficiency of prayer in your life, you're actually destroying. But it's simple. It's simple. I want us to grow in this area. You can imagine why. And so we're going to slowly work on developing a habit of prayer, interceding prayer. And to help us do that, I put in the back of your notes what we'll just call prayer prompts. If you could turn over that notes page. They're prayer prompts. Because in prayer, I'm vocalizing some things. I'm vocalizing things. I'm saying things out loud because I'm the image bearer of God. And when God creates something, what does God do? He says it out loud. He doesn't say it in his head because he's afraid someone's listening. He doesn't kind of create, I have an unspoken creation. No, he says it out loud. That's how God prays. That's how God speaks. That's how God does things. He manifests. And so we're going to vocalize the burdens of our heart. We're going to vocalize the brokenness of creation. We're going, to vo- we're going to vocalize the boldness of evil that we see in front of us. We're going to vocalize the blessings of God. Like, Paul, this is getting weird. Oh, you have no idea. You have no idea. So would you do something with it? Would you stand up, please? 
And for some of you, you're not comfortable praying out loud or praying in the presence of others. I respect that. Um, you don't know what to pray. That's why I put those prompts in front of you. We're just going to take a few minutes. I have some prayer cards here that uh, people have shared with me uh, that I'm going to pray over. And maybe just for a couple minutes, you could use these prompts to guide your prayer time. Uh, you could say the Lord's Prayer. Uh, maybe there's someone that you know has some certain needs. So you could just say, you know, our, our Father, will you please meet the needs of so-and-so? So-and-so is sick or so-and-so is facing. or I'm just bringing you, Father, because I, 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 I'm participating in recreation. I am representing the Creator. Or our Father, would you deliver so-and-so? I recognize, Father, that, that evil has wrapped itself around. Will you bring deliverance? It's in the Lord's Prayer. Deliver us from evil. Yeah. The red letters, the ones that count. Our Father, shine your favor on our fellowship. God, would you manifest your presence here to restore and help us to be a, a lighthouse for those who are wandering, a city upon a hill for those who need hope. Our Father, would you protect our fellowship? Because while here is the flock, we know out there is the wolves. And so I'm asking, as you feel comfortable, to pray these things out loud. As I pray through these, I'm going to turn off my microphone because I know that my voice can be really distracting when it's really loud. Okay? And you just, you pray through these things. And uh, then we're going to move into a time of song. Okay? Let's pray together. Thank you for sharing your time with us, and we'd love for the journey to continue. If you're a guest, would you consider reaching out to us? We would love to come alongside and encourage you in any way that we can. If you're someone who's joined us today and you are desperately reaching to find hope wherever you can, again, Jesus came that we would find hope. You can find hope today. If you want to send us a short note, a member of our hope team would reach out quickly, promptly, to come alongside and see what we can do to encourage you in whatever storm you might find yourself in. That's why Jesus came. That's why we're here. Jesus said there's two ways to live your life. And a wise man, a wise woman, builds their life on Jesus' instructions. God bless.